Hey, everybody. This is Tom Salemi. Welcome back to the Device Talks Weekly Podcast. Very happy to have our pal Chris Newmarker back on the podcast, giving his Newmarker's Newsmakers. Before we roll into this week's episode, which will include another Device Talks fastball pitch from our friends at Fluid IQ, we'll also have a uh, little bit of a, a best of part of an interview I did with Stephen Osterley, formerly of Medtronic, now doing many, many other great things. And uh, finally, I'll have a sit down. Uh, well, we were both sitting down in different parts of the country, but I talked with Brian Lord, the CEO of Pristine Surgical. He was actually at a hotel room at JP Morgan. So I was happy to be able to connect with him while he was out there. But before we start, I want to share some great news. Registration is open for Device Talks Boston. I've got a very, very, very preliminary agenda up there. We've got a few of our keynote speakers up there, but much, much more to come. But uh, do check out devicetalks.com and do register. Take advantage of our early bird rate. You will save uh, over 40% off of our full price and uh, a lot more than that over our day of registration. So I advise you please to use the early bird registration rate uh, so you'll save yourself a ton of money. And uh, please don't wait for the date of the show. Please uh, register in advance. And uh, we'd love to see you there. It's going to be a great two days. We're paired with our robotic friends, the Healthcare Robotics Engineering Forum, and the Robotics Summit and Expo. But uh, I'm excited to have Tom Poland as our opening keynote. We talked about that last week. And uh, this week, I'm happy to announce that Mike Mahoney, CEO of Boston Scientific, will be closing out our first day as our keynote. So I'll continue to uh, introduce keynote speakers and other speakers as uh, as we go on with the podcast, but I really do hope you'll join us at Device Talks Boston again. That is May 10th and May 11th at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center, and uh, it's going to be a great couple of days. So go to devicetalks.com for more information about that. All right, I think I've said enough. Let us get this podcast started. All right, you ready for this? Ready. Chris Newmarker, how are you, sir? Welcome back. Happy New Year. Yes, Happy New Year. Uh, we're 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 talking today on Friday the thirteenth. Ah, that's right. Ah, ah. Well, we're not superstitious, are we? No, 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 no absolutely not. Oh, sorry. I was just saying, like, let me get my. Uh, I just need to put my rabbit foot down here. All right. So what, <laughs> what, what are we? Uh, no. I, I've become a med tech uh, industry client. I don't know if you can see my teeth. I got Invisaligns on. Ooh, I got I braces. I, I, I can't even notice, man. Yeah, right. Because they're Invisaligns. Because yeah, they can't awesome. see them. So yeah. So I had a little. Uh, my my lower canine was still a baby tooth, and after fifty something years, it decided I've done enough. Time to go. Time to go. So they're re repositioning my lower crowded jaw, and uh, oh. it's working pretty well. I remember oh, covering the private, the like the venture capital rounds for Align Technologies and the IPO. So it's like twenty it's years later. When you- who knew? Right. Yeah, Someday. Kind of, ex- kind of exciting when you write about technologies and you, you like actually use them. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, I'm glad it's not a pacemaker or defibrillator or anything else like that. You're going to use a med tech device. This is a, this is a good gateway med tech device, I think. When I um, did my uh, annual checkup last year, for, I'm getting old enough that for the first time I um, got to, you know, find out the process with exact sciences. Oh, know. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was exciting. <laughs> I bet that was exciting. <laughs> I was like, "Wow, I've written about this. And now I'm living it." All right, but it's better than the alternative, which yes. I'm hoping to avoid another year or two, hopefully. <laughs> and, and these are better than the alternative of braces. My son had the braces, and I much right? prefer these. So, uh, yes. so thank you, MedTech, no. for making no. our lives a little bit easier. No hardware in Tom's mouth, and uh, like, are you gonna? play some rest in peace music for your uh your canine tooth like oh like, rest in peace tom's canine it was a little trooper little trooper yeah. but uh, all right well i know yeah. you uh, right. we're short on time and we yes. have bam bam bang boom, boom news going on week. this week it's like a murderer's row all the biggies so let's start at number a lot five going on. Well, number five. This was a. This was my own creation um you know the, uh, the, the yeah right woohoo the Phillips recall 
it's just, I mean, it's just been a, a huge, a huge story on mass device over the uh, the past two years. I mean, it's um, definitely one of the most um, serious recalls I'd say the industry's ever had. I mean, you're talking about millions of CPAPs. Yep. Um, you know, you got you know FDA report. You know, ninety thousand. You know, MDR reports now into FDA, you know, and, and including 260 matching deaths. Of course, M- MDR is an imperfect system. It's passive, but still, I mean, that that's a lot. And, uh, you know, and even actually this week, we had the J.P. Morgan conference in, in San Francisco, and uh, ResMed's been Philip's big competitor in the CPAP space. And, you know, CEO McFarrell, you know, his, his company's been you know, facing all these supply chain challenges, trying to, you know, uh, and try, trying to meet all this excess demand after Phelps mm-hmm. left the market in 2021. He said at this point that, uh, I mean, he, he was saying that, you know, there's some parts of the world where if, you know, you get diagnosed with sleep apnea and your doctor's saying, you know, you should really start using a CPAP to, you know, prevent serious health problems. Um, you could be waiting up to 12 weeks to get a CPAP right now, which is, uh, I mean, you know, a feral describe that as a as a humanitarian emergency i mean mm-hmm. but it's it's definitely frustrating if you know you're being told that you need a certain you know medical technology and you're having to wait that long so anyway um like what i did was i went through mass devices archives and you know compiled this uh you know you know nice big timeline of how this all unfolded that's on mass device you know you can check it out it's how philip's significant respiratory device recall unfolded and you can just you know kind of you know, see how, you know, you had like a whole decade where, you know, few problems were reported. And then after, you know, Philip's initial recall announcement in April 2021, everything just, you know, started to, uh, you know, cascade. And, you know, here we are at this point, they have a new CEO who's publicly apologized. They're still in consent decree talks with the Justice Department, you know, still, you know, kind of unclear, you know, when they'll you know, be able to re-enter, enter the market as, you know, as they, you know, work through all of these, uh, you know, respiratory devices that, uh, you know, that need, need to be fixed. No, you, uh, you certainly set out to connect all the dots and there are a lot of dots. A lot of dots. A, a lot of, I was scrolling down this. I'm like, oh my God, you're right. You know, it's, we, you know, we've been talking about it, but to have it all in one, in one timeline and just kind of walk through it and see the, the, the step after step. Uh, that's that's gone on through this uh, this tragedy um, is it's it was really impressive. So good piece of uh, reporting there. Oh, thanks, Tom. I mean, yeah, I mean, just even like too. I mean, like the sound abatement from degrading and potentially getting into airways is like the big recall. But you know, as I was assembling this this timeline, I mean, there's just all these other like ancillary serious recalls that were coming in. I mean, it just looks like all kinds of you know cascading. You know problems over there so like here's you know here's to hoping that uh you know under uh you know under ceo roy jacobs they can you know finally like turn this all around and you know we can we can move on from this absolutely all right well let us uh roll on to number four another big big story yeah sterogenics uh they agreed to pay 408 million dollars to settle this you know like 870 ethylene oxide lawsuits that were filed about the local and federal level in, in Illinois, um, you know, and uh, ETO sterilization. It's one of the major ways that uh, device companies, uh, you know, sterilize their devices, but it's just become a huge issue. You know, the EPA has, uh, you know, identified facilities around the country where they're, you know, saying that, you know, there's a risk to communities from the from emissions, you know, I mean, like the, the EPA said that, you know, you could have, you know, potentially elevated cancer risk, especially, you know, blood cancers, breast cancers, FDA's you know, working with the industry and you know, trying to even like, you know, ha- you know, have challenges to come up with new uh, sterilization methods. But mm-hmm. this is, uh, you know, sterogenics. Uh, they're not saying that Willowbrook, you know, posed, a, you know, safety risk to the, the community. They're still maintaining that. But they were just saying it was time to it was time to move on and, you know, pay full attention to their business operations rather than fighting all these lawsuits. I mean, you know, and it's also worth mentioning, like, I mean, they had, I mean, the settlement comes about four months after, you know, a Cook County jury awarded a, a three hundred and sixty three million dollar verdict in, in one of these lawsuits. So, I mean, this is uh, which which just got attention across the medtech industry because, I mean, the, I mean, the, the industry could be you know, facing a lot of, a lot of liability and with these lawsuits potentially. Absolutely. It's a huge issue. Huge issue. Of course, we've been talking about that. We'll talk about it a bit today. Uh, I'll be talking with Brian Lord, the CEO of Pristine Surgical, uh, which uh, just uh, got FDA 510K notification for a, a new uh, single use uh, scope. So uh, this is certainly something we'll continue to see more of yeah. things that don't require 
disinfection, uh, but also, uh, you know, we had conversations like we with uh, CL10 of FIAX a couple of months ago on new ways to uh, sterilize medical equipment. So uh, this is going to be a continuing story. Something like, though, even like that single-use scope, I mean, it's it needs to be disinfected before it gets shipped out somewhere. So, right. I mean, it, it'd point. be interesting. Yeah, I mean, so... Like, yeah, I mean, how do you, you know, sterilize a large amount of uh, finished medical devices that are in packaging on pallets? You know, I mean, ETO has always been pretty great. I mean, I even remember visiting one packaging company once, you know, talking about how they use Tyvek, you know, like, this, you know, the same type of material you see on houses, but, you know, it gets the ETO in and it keeps it in Yep. You know, to, to sterilize. So, so I, it's, it's a tough, uh, it's a tough issue. You know, and, uh, you know, perhaps, you know, I've, I've heard the argument that perhaps, you know, the, the biggest solution might just be like, we need to get, you know, more plants updated so that they aren't, you know, leaking the gas out as much. Uh, you know, I mean, certainly Sterogenics, you know, competitor Steris has been really big about the fact that they've updated their plants so much. So, mm-hmm. so you know, we'll, you know, we'll see how this plays out. So next up, we're going to have our uh, new fastball segment where uh, we're inviting medtech startups to uh, give us their two-minute pitches. So if you're interested in being part of the podcast and want to tell your startup's story on Device Talks Weekly, connect with me on LinkedIn, and uh, I'll tell you how you can do it. And uh, we uh, essentially just invite you to uh, record your message, and uh, I use the message as is. So we don't verify claims or anything like that, but uh, we want to give everyone a chance to tell their story and hopefully make some important connections with investors or future partners. All right, we'll take a break from the New Markets Newsmakers to hear this week's fastball pitch. It's being thrown by Teresa Barnes. She is co-founder of a really cool company called Fluid IQ. Recently, we all watched in disbelief as an NFL player was resuscitated on the football field. That experience has increased awareness of emergency response efforts. We learned that even when a heart is restarted with CPR, sometimes a patient still can't breathe on their own. The current standard of care for resuscitation is a manual device that ironically looks almost identical to a football. It's been around 70 years and has major limitations that threaten lives. Manual resuscitation requires multiple personnel to manage a single patient, and the worst part is it can inadvertently harm patients, causing them to be on ventilators longer or if even lead to death. Hi, I'm Teresa Barnes, and I'm a founder and the president of Fluid IQ. We developed a tiny tool that can automatically put air in their lungs at the right pressures to protect them. Our solution is called Hope Invent. It's a lipstick-sized resuscitator and ventilator that fits in the pocket of the paramedic. It needs no batteries or electricity and is designed to disrupt the resuscitation space. The first responder connects our invent to a compressor or air source, and it automatically breathes for the patient. It was designed by respiratory care and emergency doctors working with engineers to create a resuscitation device to improve outcomes. We harness the capabilities of 3D printing and the simple science of fluidics, the secret sauce that powers our innovation and is the basis for our filed patents. We continue a more than two-year collaboration with the NIH National Institutes of Health. And the NIH director's blog told the world recently about our technology, saying these ventilators could be a simple yet powerful tool. We believe our tiny handheld resuscitator and ventilator will improve emergency medicine, saving lives in pandemics and disasters, and saving lives on the battlefield and on the football field. Thank you, Tom and Device Talks, for inviting us to throw our fastball pitch. My email is Teresa at fluidiq.org. All right, let us uh, roll on to, on to number three. Hey, well, you know, number three, um, you know, sorry, Tom, this is just like a really cheery uh, newsmakers today. I know, right? It's like, wow, me down. Like, oh my gosh, it really is Friday the 13th or something. Um, you know, <laughs> um, I mean, Verily uh, laid off, uh, you know, announced that they were laying off 15% of, uh, of their workforce. Um, you know, they, uh, you know, they, they have, a new CEO that they, uh, you know, promoted up, Stephen uh, Gillette, and you know he issued a, you know, a letter to, to to all Verily employees that was titled "Only Verily Forward." Um, you know, and he just, you know, as part of transparency, he said that they were going to be one Verily Forward. One Verily Forward. Sorry, said, yeah. what did I say? Yeah. 
Only. Yeah. Only verily forward. <laughs> that actually sounds pretty good too. I mean, one verily forward, and you know, he you know said as part of transparency, he was you know letting them know that you know they'd uh, you know eliminated about you know fifteen percent of the rules due to you know discontinued uh, you know programs, you know, but. Um, you know, it's, it looks like they're kind of you know tightening the, the ship over there. Um, we are in a tech recession right now. I mean, there have been a lot of uh, high tech companies, you know, cutting cutting jobs. But um, you know, here's to uh, you know, here's to hoping that you know this uh, belt tightening and refocusing over at uh, Verily allows it to you know kind of you know grow and meet kind of the promises some pe- people have said for it in the you know in the med tech space. I know you had you know Stephen Osterley on last year who is still like sticking by. You know, like, you know, the, you know, his, his prediction that Verily was like one of the most exciting companies in med tech right now. And, um, yeah, and we'll, and we'll play a portion of that interview just, uh, where Steven sort of talked about Verily's, uh, Verily's uh, uh, objective and its approach and, and, you know, why he was still a, a believer in Verily. Yeah. And, and we also spoke a bit about, uh, Verily's partnership with, uh, J and J over surgical robotics with Verb Surgical. So, uh, We'll include a clip of that. So, and I and I read that Verily's uh, uh, discontinuing some of their, I thought, some of their more uh, innovative ideas in terms of um, uh, needleless drug delivery and, and things like that. So, uh, it's unfortunately that yeah. I seem to be moving away from that. But I, I don't know what type of uh, what type of if there was a single type of uh, worker who has been laid off. But the good news for them, I suppose, is. Uh, the med tech industry, I see nothing, but we're hiring posts out on LinkedIn for medical device companies. Yeah. So hopefully they'll they'll find a new job uh, relatively quickly. Yeah, I mean, like a host of med tech companies are increasingly, you know, we were just talking about this yesterday. I mean, a uh, you know, host of medical device companies, a lot of the innovations like moving over to like digital and software and, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, there should be some, uh, you know, some really skilled people right now looking for work because of this, uh, uh, you know, reduction over Verily. Well, as Chris Newmark mentioned, we had Steve Osterley, the former Medtronic executive, who uh, once famously predicted that uh, Google would be a, uh, a major competitor to Medtronic, perhaps the most uh, significant competitor to Medtronic. Uh, he had made this prediction probably 10 or 15 years ago. So uh, it was still early on in uh, in the, the courtship or the marriage of technology and med tech. So uh, Steve has got an excellent uh, overview of the field. And I talked to him for the podcast uh, last summer. I'll include a link to the entire episode in the show notes. But here's a, a five minute uh, snippet where he and I talked a bit about Verily. Interesting. I want to get into Moon Surgical in a moment, but I do I do want to circle back just on the Google comment because you, you, before we started uh, recording this, you, you, know, you mentioned that this was your prediction that Google was going to be a, a large competitor or the competitor for Medtronic certainly drew a lot of attention and attention and uh, probably some tension too. But mostly I was thinking about attention. What does that look like? You mentioned you mentioned Verily and, 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 it, and the traction it's getting, but does this mean that Verily or whatever iteration it takes when this ultimately comes to fruition, is it developing medical devices? Is it, is it working with medical device makers? Do you see it this time? And I, I know you're not Nostradamus, but do you see medical device companies looking remarkably different because they're approaching this from sort of a data and electronic side, electric side versus the traditional direction where they've come from manufacturing and creating metal or plastic things that perform functions? Yeah, I mean, look, my thesis about Google was that whoever has the most data and knows how to aggregate it and analyze it is going to win in healthcare. And Google gets over a billion searches a day in healthcare, over a billion a day, they tell me. And so you realize if you have access to those data, you can learn a lot about what is ailing people, what what solutions people are seeking, who would be great people to direct to clinical trials, who would be great people to direct to therapies, you name it. And so Google saw that, they formed Verily, and they are making products. I mean, they've made them largely through JVs. I'm sure you're aware that they started surgical robots with J&J. For spun it, J&J realized the value and ultimately bought it back from them. But they have a deep, deep program in neuromodulation with GSK, who, of course, years ago started their venture program, Action Potential Ventures. And GSK classic pharmaceutical company is probably the first of the big pharma companies to fully recognize the potential of electrons as drugs. And so GSK is all in, and I don't think it's publicly disclosed, but it's a large number. 
with Verily to make neuromodulation devices. And Verily actually has some really good skills at MEMS manufacturing. And so hmm. um, you may remember there, the first time people heard about Google was when they bought this contact lens that could sense glucose. Yep. That came Working out of, with Alcon, I believe, right? That came out of the University of Washington. And they hired most of those people. They have a big MEMS manufacturing capability. They have a wafer fab. And they do really interesting stuff at Verily. But what I like about Verily is that is the baseline project where they've lined up 10,000 people and basically have, I think, around four terabytes of data on each person that from scanning to blood test to genomic, proteomic, biome sequencing. And they're using this uh, for discovery. And this, this leads into this whole field of computational biology, uh, in which I think Verily is going to lead at. But because there's nobody, I, I mean, so who else could do this? I mean, Microsoft could have tried to do this. Um, IBM tried to do this. But Google, I mean, Amazon maybe could try to do this. But Google has by far the most profound capabilities in data aggregation and and analytics to basically start to look at who benefits from devices, who should get a device, what device should they get. I mean, all of that to me derives from real world data and and tracking it, aggregating it. And I, I still think Verily wins at this. Absolutely. I believe it. But was Verily with its work with, and we'll get into robotic surgery now, but Verily's work with robotic surgery. I mean, I, I think people saw that as an effort that didn't work necessarily. And maybe well, people I are. Totally maybe, dis- yeah, I disagree with that. I mean, they, they they set out a pathway and a trajectory for J&J that I thought was very rational. I'll tell you what I think is publicly understood about it. But what they wanted to do was daisy chain all these robots around the country that J&J was going to build and stream data from it to begin to inform surgeons about technique. So that, and you could probably see if you had a thousand robots doing cholecystectomy, that you could learn a lot about what works, what doesn't work. And basically if once 5G got roaring and you could have sort of no latency, you could do remote proctoring. I mean, just one thing after another. So I, I think that was part of the pathway. I mean, Google of course, didn't need to make instruments. Ethicon makes interest. That's the easy part. What J&J didn't know how to do was what I just told you. How do you aggregate data coming off of these robots? How do you learn from them? Google was doing some interesting things in imaging as well that would be part of the the scope for imaging. So, yeah, I mean, I think J&J ultimately saw the value of Verb and took it back. I don't think it failed in any way. So, but I haven't heard much about what how Verb's doing. You know, Scott Hennekins was running that. He left. And so I, I don't really know. What's happened to it since I lost visibility once it left Verily again? As a, so I serve as a proxy at Verily for Tomasic. And so Tomasic invested, they own at 1.20% of Verily. And I, I've been a senior advisor to Tomasic for years. And if we get into what I'm doing now, I can tell you a little bit about why I work with people like Tomasic, but they write very large checks. They wrote one to Alphabet to basically support Verily. But I've lost visibility to Verb once it left. But I, I don't think it failed in any way within the hands of Andy Conrad and his merry pranksters at Google. All right, let's move on to uh, on to number two, Chris Newmarker. Well, number two is uh, is that Medtronic uh, has a new chief quality officer. His name's Scott Cundy. Um, he uh, he comes to Medtronic from a Danaher, you know, another you know really large company, you know, where he held you know, held, uh, you know, a, a VP of quality regulatory and clinical affairs role, role at the diagnostics and life sciences businesses. And, you know, he, he actually has Medtronic experience. He held regulatory jobs, Medtronic in the early two thousands. But I mean, we've, we've talked on here, you know, for months about, I mean, Medtronic's been really, you know, they've been working through their own, you know, uh, you know, kind of like quality regulatory challenges. Um, you know, they discontinued, you know, their, uh, their HVAD pulled out of the LVAD Mm -hmm. space, but there's still a decent number of of people who have those devices in them and, you know, recalls, serious recalls have still, uh, you know, rolled out around it. And basically because if you have a pump attached to your heart, you know, if anything goes wrong, it's, you know, it's usually a serious problem. Um, you know, and they, uh, their diabetes business as well. Uh, like, like, I guess the one good news is that Medtronic, you know, uh, like in their most recent earnings, uh, you know, call like, uh, like their, their CEO, Jeff Martha, like explained that they have, you know, worked through 100% of the items at a warning letter around their diabetes business, which had presented a lot of challenges. So it looks like they're mm-hmm. moving beyond that. But I mean, it just, uh, you know, looks like they're, uh, you know, bringing in, 
you know, somebody new to, you know, you know hopefully, uh, you know, just, you know, boost their, their quality even more. Um, and their, uh, their, their previous chief quality officer, uh, Noel Colon, has moved to, to a, a senior vice president of research and, uh, and development job there. No, they've, they've certainly had some changes over there. First of all, speaking about the uh, the HVADs, I did I did speak with. Uh, we'll have Raj Thomas. He's vice president and general manager of mechanical circulatory support at Medtronic, and that's the group that's basically charged uh, charged with and responsible for supporting the patients with the uh, with the pumps wow. for patients who, who still had them. So it was an interesting conversation. Different different type of uh, uh, of a med tech business. But yeah. uh, going back to the the new faces at at Medtronic, we've seen uh, yeah a number of new folks. Coming in, uh, some retirements. John Mack, the uh, who is the president of cardiac surgery, he announced his retirement. So definitely some turnover. You mentioned diabetes. You got change of di- diabetes as well uh, with Q Delaro, who came in uh, late last year or the middle of last year. So uh, yeah. Medtronic seems to be uh, making the effort to to get a, a team in place yeah. that. Uh, that moves forward at the clip that I know they want to move. They certainly have had some stumbles of late. Yeah, it always reminds me of a sports team kind of making some changes and yeah, right? shuffling around some posts, bringing in some new, you know, who can we get in the draft? Who can, who can we trade? You know, so yeah, hopefully, uh, you know, especially being uh, being in Minnesota, you know, there's such a you know large presence in the medical device industry here. I mean, operationally run out of Fridley, you know, just, you know, just uh, up, uh, up highway, you know, 169 for me. So, um, you know, it'd, it'd be great to, uh, yeah, great to see like things get like getting boosted over there. That'd be awesome. Absolutely. All right. Let us, uh, let us roll into number one, Chris Newmarket. What's the big story of the week? Oh, number one. Oh, this was actually, um, a surprise, uh, but it's just gotten a lot of attention on a uh, mass device. Um, I, I just love how like our, you know, it's, 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 a, it's just awesome. Like looking at, you know the, the the page views and like getting like getting like insights from our audience on like hey what what what's important you know and you know the cardiac sense uh, which is a uh, Israeli company uh, won FDA clearance for a medical grade uh, watch called the uh, CSF three and you know I think what's really interesting about this watch I mean there's all these watches out there now that people are developing that are looking at vital signs but you no know, it looks at beat by beat heart ra- rate and you know, then, you know, including like this approval, like as for like, you know, continuous AFib monitoring, but, you know, it also uh, looks at oxygen saturation of um, the arterial uh, hemoglobin, um, which is, you know, just another really important thing to watch for. I mean, I'm just, mm-hmm. I'm just even thinking of like how during the, uh, you know, pandemic, you know, I was, you know, like if I had a bad cold, and I was, you know, trying to figure out whether it was COVID, you know, start, you know, check, you know, oxygen, you know, to see how things were going for you. Um, I think a lot of people, you know, kind of realize the importance of that measurement. Absolutely. No, it certainly would be a good, good indicator of whether you need to go to the hospital or not if you, uh, if you have difficulties. So uh, definitely a good barometer to, uh, pun intended, I guess, watch. <laughs> But um, yeah. and, and we had some additional uh, watch news this week too, right? Um, yes. Um, you know, we actually had. Oh, and just to add, like, uh, like Cardiac says, that says they're engaged in discussions with prospective U.S.-based commercial partners over this watch. So it's gonna be it's gonna be really, uh, yeah, really, uh, you know, interesting to see like who ends up partnering with them on this, and uh, you know, here in the U.S. But uh, yes, you know, the other you know big news was that uh, you know, uh, Massimo. Uh, one with an administrative court judge uh, over their, uh, you know, patent spat with uh, Apple, you know, claiming that Apple was, you know, using some of their technology in the uh, in the Apple Watch, and this now, you know, goes up to the ITC, and you know, there's a, you know, there's a chance the ITC could, uh, you know, could ban imports of the uh, Apple Watch over this, which would just be like huge, and you know, I, wow, I, mean, I mean, Massimo could, you know, basically negotiate a pretty good. Um, royalty stream from apple over all of this um so just 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 really big moves, news on that front i mean massimo has their own you know uh you know smart watch that they're uh, you know medical you know smart watch that they're rolling out to uh, you know look at medical metrics and uh you know it's uh definitely definitely could give them a boost to have a nice uh nice nice revenue stream from um from apple if you know this goes forward um i guess i i saw an analyst said that president biden could could step in if he wanted to and stop the import ban, but it's very rare to do that. So, um, yeah, we'll see what the ITC does. But it's, it's definitely a really interesting case to watch right now. It's fascinating to just see how uh, the bar continues to, to climb or raise with with watches. I mean, I've got a probably a four or five year old Apple Watch at this point, so I certainly need a refresh. But uh, we've gone a long way from ooh, this might 
you know, this might detect AFib and you can maybe check your heart rate to all the functionality that these watches now have yeah. uh, in just a short amount of time. I, just, so. I got a Fitbit Versa 4 for Christmas. You know, it's, it's pretty snazzy, pretty nice. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, it's like buzzing me and telling me like, oh, you just exercised for... <laughs> <laughs> thanks watch thanks watch you know i thought i was just going to the grocery store really quick but you know i'm glad it was an exercise too good to know <laughs> i feel better already well brian lord welcome to the podcast great to be with you tom thanks for the invite so uh we're, we're i'm planning to run this on the friday of jp morgan you are out there i am not without going too far into detail how, how are things over there i hear there's rain and I'm sure there's a lot of people, but uh, totally worth it, worth the trip. Yeah, look, I think this is JP Morgan number five for me or so. And so after you got, you've gone through it a couple of times, you kind of understand what a unique drill, the whole exercise of JP Morgan really is. You get a little bit uh, wiser for the, for the process. So that's all the sort of usual, you know, reboot post COVID that we all came to know and expect in JP Morgan. Then, of course, as you allude to, uh, thrown in with uh, some weather twists and turns. I do recall ruining a couple pairs of shoes in times <laughs> past. This is a unique one with uh, whatever they're calling the, uh, the, the the weather pattern that's yeah. running over us. Yesterday was was nice. Today, uh, we're, we're getting hit with it, but just adds to the lore, right, of uh, JP Morgan 2023. It's a, it's a bonding experience. It brings you all together. And it's certainly it's an icebreaker yeah. when uh, you come <laughs> well, in. Well, as you wet. know, you don't need a lot of icebreakers in JP Morgan. That's kind of the whole, <laughs> the whole drill in the evenings, right? Well, uh, that's awesome. That's true. Let's just continue that. Speaking of icebreakers, so you, you, Pristine Surgical had some some great news this week. January 5th, you released it. You announced that you had 510K clearance from the uh, from the FDA for your uh, 4K single-use surgical atheroscope. Obviously, I'm reading from the release. Let's talk a bit about the approval. Then I do want to get back sort of into your background and how you got into med tech. But what is so important about uh, this particular approval and what does it mean for, for Pristine Surgical? Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is really the second approval that we've received so far okay. on, on our single-use arthroscope platform. This approval, though, is the most important because this is the one on our high-volume manufacturing version of the device that allows us to go full-on to market. And so, as you probably know, and a lot of the listeners know, you know, there's a variety of different strategies that companies take in terms of product development and stages to the market. And we took a rather familiar path. We received a 510K several years ago on a low scale, let's call it, version of our device that proved out the functionality, the, of course, the safety and the repeatability of the manufacturing of the device. But it wasn't really at the scale that we needed to in, in order to be able to deliver a single use device at the economics that of course our customers are, are, are gonna be looking for. This 510K approval by contrast is the approval of the design that's capable now of high volume manufacturing. And so we've got that, that uh, prepared and ready to go. Of course, we'll be scaling that manufacturing capacity as we roll that out with an initial pilot line and then developing further. But as far as the approval goes, the revisions that we made to the design to bring really an order of magnitude improvement in the efficiency of the assembly and of the design is now fully blessed and uh, cleared by the FDA. Let's take a minute to focus on uh, the origins of Pristine Surgical. Can you talk a bit about the origins of its technology and when did you become involved with the company? Yeah. Well, the origins really go back a couple of decades, believe it or not. Uh, a couple of surgeons in Chicago had an idea for uh, a panable scope. Panable meaning, uh, if you're familiar with arthroscopies, the scopes have an angle so that you can get a hemispherical view when you rotate the, the image. And for a variety of different surgical procedures, in some cases, most of the cases, you like to have a 30 degree angle. Sometimes surgeons like to use a 70 degree angle. And so the origin story is that the surgeons went out to solve that challenge in how can you have a device that is able to deliver a 30 degree view as well as a 70 degree view in the same device, a so-called panable scope. And so they worked for, gosh, a number of years, you know, classic kind of garage tinkering with an inventor friend and got that to a proof of concept prototype. And it was really at that proof of concept prototype that the present day pristine was really born. I was doing some work with Dean Kamen, who is the famous med tech developer in Manchester, New Hampshire, which is where I live. And as it so happened, the then CEO of this fledgling company had reached out to me and said, hey, we've got a prototype. We would really like to see if we could get introduced to DECA to see if we can take this prototype to the next level. 
Long story short, the discussion ensued. Uh, DECA thought that this was an opportunity that they could really help take to the next level. And through the course of a variety of different conversations, it really came out to be the fact that single use is really the particular value proposition that we focused on. And DECA were the ones that said, look, we think we can help you with this device, but what if we could do this in a single use modality? And so I got to give give credit to Dean and his engineers for spotting that technology opportunity, probably well ahead of the curve, frankly, to know that we were seeing a convergence with consumer electronics with the cost curve on those components, and that probably the technological capabilities were mature enough that you could deliver this capability in the prototype in a single use modality. And so that's how the company was born, not reborn at that stage. And we pursued a development pathway that led to that first 510K that I, I alluded to. And so we made that decision along the way to say, look, patentability is interesting, but it's really niche. The really big promise and the promise that we've built the pristine around is really around the single use visualization. And we've taken that and uh, and run with it. As, as you know, we have now our 4K single use arthroscope that's been approved at the manufacturing scale, but we're not a one trick pony. We also have taken the opportunity over the course of that development to develop a prototype for advanced prototype, really, for a single-use laparoscope. That's coming along very nicely. And then beyond that, we actually have prototypes in development for flexible endoscopy, single-use flexible endoscopes as well. And so we've really, if you will, leaned into that initial decision to move into single-use. And now our vision is really to be a, a single-use endoscopy company, broadly stated. Okay. Well, let's talk a bit about the origins of we've had we've discussed single use on the podcast before. We've had Boston Scientific and Ambu on here, but I'm I'm curious in Olympus. I'm curious as to your perspective on what what has been driving the desire for single use scopes. We're seeing news just this week of uh, Stereogenics and their uh, settlement of a, of a lawsuit over ethylene oxide and the, and the concerns over cleaning of scopes and reusing scopes. I'm not sure which was the chicken, which was the egg. I'm not sure what came first. What, from your perspective, was sort of the initial drivers for single-use scopes? Yeah, it's a great question. Look, you know, hindsight is always twenty twenty, right? So you could you could sort of craft this kind of straight line crystal ball into the into the future. But like most product development stories, I don't think they work out nearly. You know, the, the, the reality they probably didn't work out quite that that way. I think the the most effective way to describe how we came to see single use as the core of the technology really is about thinking about the capabilities of a digital scope, most importantly, that in that environment where you're shifting from a very expensive CapEx laden, and frankly, a lot of technology that's legacy technology, you're really boxed into that rod lens environment. And from a development perspective, are really limited in the amount of things that you can do. And so you know, I think over time, we certainly have continued to unpack and realize broader value propositions that single use brings to the table, such as, of course, sterility, such as uh, efficiency in the uh, surgical prep, such as consistency of the image that comes with a new scope every time. Lost in that is a little bit, um, you know, if you will, kind of engineering speak, which probably is the, the the right kernel that started that pathway it's the palette of technology that you can bring to bear in a single use device with all of these really marvelous components from the from the global consumer electronic supply chain that you can put into a surgical device and all the things that you can do with that so one of the things we talk about for example on this point amongst a variety of different value propositions is that our scope is future proofed that device that our customer uses is always, by definition, also the latest, greatest technology that's come recently off of the assembly line. So anytime a new improvement might come along in the hardware side of things, in uh, image sensors, or in in software, that's going to be incorporated recently in that most recent product run that we've run that ultimately ends up into the hands of uh, of the surgeon. So it's really that digital platform, I think, that, that inspired the first commitment to single use. And then as mm-hmm. I said, we found a lot of other attributes, certainly in route. Interesting. So 
Let, let's talk a bit about the endoscopic, the market opportunity. Uh, looking at your site, you sort of break things down into the rigid endoscopy and flexible endoscopy. You hit upon a bit about this earlier. You're at the moment, you're focusing on, on rigid endoscopy, correct? That's, That's right. your primary yeah. focus. What went into the decision to concentrate there? Well, similarly, I'd like to claim at the time sort of, you know, crystal ball. It really was the fact that, uh, you, you know, to be frank, we were founded by a couple of sports medicine docs in, hmm. in Chicago who said, hey, let's make a better arthroscope. Uh, and that's where we started. So with that, we realized that we not only had an opportunity to deliver a disruptive arthroscope, but a lot of the attributes then that goes into delivering that device for sports medicine can be expanded upon and leveraged into other areas as well. So you're correct to reference our website. You know, there's a tremendous opportunity in sports medicine or arthroscopy with something on the order of 12 million procedures being done per year worldwide. The number's got a healthy, you know, growth rate to it, certainly. But you double that opportunity when you move into general surgery. And then you add another 100 million procedures, believe it or not, when you move into the flexible endoscopy space. So you put all of that together under one platform, you've got a tremendous opportunity to impact 125 million procedures per year. So as you've mentioned, some companies have come about it from the flexible side of things that have said, for example, look, challenges we know about with FDA, we know about with class action lawsuits from, from a variety of different companies around the cleaning side of the reusable flexible scopes. And certainly we can expect that the origin story for some of the single use devices, for example, you probably are aware that uh, Ambu's single-use device comes out of an acquisition of a company called uh, Invendo. I think Invendo had the idea that that single-use flexible device would address those primary concerns around sterilization and, and infection reduction. That was their path into the single-use arena, if you will. Our path came a little bit from a different place, and then they converge, right? And what's interesting from this, from a from a marketing perspective, is that you know it's a little bit of a blessing and a curse, is that you have multiple value propositions for multiple different verticals and procedures and for, for different procedure environments as well, whether it be hospitals, ambulatory surgery centers, specialty ambulatory surgery centers, multidisciplinary ambulatory surgery centers, and procedure volume differs. So for a variety of different constituencies and for a variety of different profiles of surgeons, they'll have slightly different takes on what it is about single use that, that they like and what it is it that, that draws them to the product. But of course, look, that's a that's a blessing of riches too. At the same time, we get to then talk about a variety of different attributes that we can bring to the table with uh, with our devices. Sure. So I want to talk a bit more about the move into flexible space in a moment, and uh, understand what you have working on there. But just focusing on on the rigid for a second, how does a, a smaller company like Pristine begin now that you have the the go ahead with this uh, device that will be you'll be able to provide more ample supply of? How do you go into competing for procedures in in the in the rigid endoscopy space? Right. So, I guess multiple uh, ways to answer that question. To start with, we've had a commercial team that's been part of of Team Pristine for a couple of years now. That's been helping us refine the value proposition and prepare for this plateau that we're at today. Of course, pre-selling is prohibited. But learning about the market, introducing folks and getting feedback from the market and what that initial value proposition looks like is, of course, encouraged and helpful. And our commercial team has been doing just that, listening to, to feedback, making sure that the inputs from our surgeons and from our medical advisory board members are incorporated appropriately into our, our product development and, and realized and able to be delivered. And now we have the opportunity, of course, to circle back with folks who've expressed interest as we've been at booths and who, who know us and say, when the time is right, give us a call. And here we are. And so our team has been waiting for this moment. Our chief commercial officer, Dave Carey, our head of sales, Thurm Ballard, have tremendous experience in this space. They probably would be embarrassed for me to say how many decades together between, between the two of them. But we uh, have two stellar professionals with deep experience in industry in both launching products, but also selling devices that we'll be competing against. And so uh, it's really about getting those Two gentlemen out the door and in front of customers now as we reach this new plateau. And then we will be using the uh, independent reps to scale. So we think that that's a very appropriate model for us as not only a startup company, but one that has this type of product capability as well. We all know as CEOs that there's a variety of pros and cons about how you scale and how you build you know, a rep force. Some people have strong opinions on you know, the fact that you should have all of that capability in-house. That has its own challenges with it, certainly from, from cost and the like. 
And other folks um, think that the independent rep pathway, which we do, well suits them. I think part of that is that we have really a device, as you know from our, our website, whose promise is to simplify endoscopy. As a result of that, it's not the hardest challenge, right, to train independent reps on how to discuss what the value proposition is of this device. More importantly, it's about getting it in their hands, getting them out in the relationships that they already have, providing the right type of support, obviously, from the, at the enterprise level. And we can scale, we think, more rapidly with that independent rep model. Hmm. Okay. And then physicians who have, or the surgeons who have expressed interest in this, I know you had, again, some on your website, you had some interviews with some doctors who explained some of the things that they're excited about. Can you share some of the benefits that the surgeons will have expressed that they'd be looking forward to? I imagine it's quicker turnover for procedures and things like that. Yeah. So look, surgeons, we'll talk about it uh, clinically first, and then we'll talk about it maybe on the the sort of facility side of things. From the surgeon's perspective, with the, the primary attribute that we hear from the surgeons is really about consistency. One of our medical advisory board members, Dr. John Ticker, is really a champion of this particular point of view. He said, look, you know, Brian, if I had something written on my medical tombstone about what I've been dedicated, you know, his decades of work in this profession, it's about taking variables out of the procedure. And the flip side of that, of course, uh, is to improve the consistency of the procedures that he and and, uh, his colleagues perform. The challenge in that pursuit is that one of the biggest variables is actually the consistency of the device by which the surgeon's eyes see the procedure that they're performing. Hmm. And, you know, it's uh, anybody's guess when you pull that, uh, when the technician pulls the blue wrap off of the scope, whether that's going to be a scope that is in tip top shape, having perhaps just come back from refurbishment or whether it's on its last legs. Interesting. It's anybody's guess sometimes, believe it or not, whether it's been properly sterilized and whether it's prepared properly through the processing. Sometimes we hear about, you know, scopes that literally have been bent and can't fit into the cannula or that have cracks on them. And so the surgeons talk about the consistency of the image and then also the other see the clarity of, of the image to know that you've got a consistent brand new scope every time coupled with a consistent 4K image that you know that you can count on with each device that's the same in every procedure. That's really the thing that they talk about the most from a clinical perspective. From a design perspective, the rest of our design requirements are to be drop into the hand familiar to the surgeon. We want to make Mm -hmm. sure that as they switch from a rod lens scope into a single use, into our single use device, that there's no changing of the muscle memory. There's no retraining that it's drop into the hand familiar. And so that's been something that we've thought about really since day one from the decade days all the way through. And that input from our medical advisory board members have been critical in that in, in that pursuit. The second half of the answer is really on the facility side of things. And as you're probably aware, many surgeons are also co-owners in their surgery centers. And so they, from the business perspective, also are interested in ways that new equipment can help improve on the facility side of uh, of the equation. And I think there's two there. One is efficiency. So certainly for ambulatory surgery centers, particularly the high volume ones, it's about having consistency of the throughput of the procedures. When there's a a problem with the scope that causes delay, when there's problems with that uh, preparation and the follow-up that can have ripple effects through the course of the day and cause challenges with with scheduling and, and the like, which of course is just lost opportunity. It's like a seat on the air, airline that that went unused if you have to have uh, if you if you experience delays in the in the OR or rescheduling that that occurs as a result of that. So you've got an efficiency on on one side of the facility perspective, and then a cost savings as well. So we're confident that. Believe it or not, well, we'll deliver faster turnaround times on our procedures. We'll deliver better visualization. We'll also deliver uh, cost savings as well, a cheaper device at the at the end of the day as well. We've built a comprehensive cost calculator that we can not only show, but also receive inputs from the facilities to be able to calculate that for our facilities on how we'll be able to save them money also by moving to this new uh, this new paradigm. Interesting. And let's look at the, the flexible side for a second. You do have up on your site a, a flexible endoscope. What is the status of that part of your pipeline? Where are you in, in development and testing? Yeah, we have what we call internally a design freeze on basically our prototype level scope. So the prototype level scope, which we can make in onesie twosies at this stage of, of the game, is fully tested, fully functional, delivers a gorgeous image, just like our, our rigid uh, scope platform. 
And we are now looking to turn the page on that similar to the way that we did on the uh, rigid side of things and start to make the preparations for the DFM activity, the design for manufacture, manufacturability activity. And do you have any timeline that you're, you have in mind? Is it, uh, and, and, and how different is, is designing that kind of product versus the, the rigid one? I imagine it's more complicated. I don't know to what degree and how different is that market? There's obviously a lot of larger competitors in that space already. Walter, good question. So yes, there are some competitors in the space already, but honestly, we don't really think about that from the, uh, the, the space from sort of a crowded competitive perspective. In fact, whether intentional or not, we, we all tend to be sort of cheerleaders for each other on LinkedIn and whatever else when folks come out with new product offerings and the single use side of things, because we all benefit from the sea change that's going on and the shift from legacy modality into, in, into single use. Huge, as I mentioned earlier, t- uh, the total available market, huge TAM. And so uh, there's plenty of procedures to go around as we see this shift. So the more value proposition is brought to the table, frankly, the more folks that are working on this space, we just think that further facilitates the transition overall in the marketplace from uh, durable into, into single-use devices. So we're cheering for our colleagues in that space. I hope I, I, I know they're cheering for us too. And there's plenty of room to, to go around for all of us. So I don't see that as the biggest challenge, certainly from to answer the other part of your question on the engineering side of things. Yeah, look, a rigid device you know, has a few moving parts. We've got a writing mechanism, which we can rotate the image on the screen that has some, some uh, mechanical you know, sophistication to it. To be able to drive a flexible device, the way those work requires a whole order of magnitude, more complexity on the mechanical side of things. So that's the biggest thing, right? You've got a, a large differentiation on the mechanical capabilities inside the, if you will, the electronics pathway from the image sensor to the image on the screen, very familiar. Uh, and that and that's where we see a lot of uh, consistency and, and certainly leverage in the platform. Great. And final question, that's normally the one I start off with, but I threw myself off with my JP Morgan talk. How did you uh, find your way into the the metal device industry? And and you you've got a, an interesting background. You have a, spent a lot of time as as an investor. So uh, is this your first stint as a, as a CEO? It's my first stint as a CEO. Yeah. Look, one of our dear colleagues coined the phrase "conspicuous outsider," right? And uh, <laughs> I I like that. I don't know if that'll go on my gravestone or not, but uh, it certainly I think is uh, a good phrase to describe sort of my point of view in the industry. And look, and uh, to be frank, I thought that was an impediment, you know, in the early days, right? I came into Pristine, as you mentioned, as an investor, I'd helped catalyze some of the seed capital to get the effort off the ground. And board at the time asked me to take a look at where we are headed and then ultimately asked me to take the, the CEO role. And uh, I did it, frankly, rather begrudgingly. I said, look, look at all these, you know, amazing resumes of people around on the street that have 20 years at Stryker and 15 years at at Smith & Nephew. You know, I'm seven years in now, so I I won't do my Midwestern aw shucks. I've I've climbed out of that uh, deficit and don't need to apologize for that anymore. And I think along the way, with if if I may, with a sort of similar level of of, uh, humility, say that being that outsider, I think has helped. It's allowed us to think a little differently about business model. Uh, We haven't talked a lot about that, but we are pursuing a subscription business model here. And I think when I first floated that idea to the board, I got a, a few sort of cross-eyed looks. And eventually over time, the idea that was floated became primary path. And we're committed to that. And that's uh, something we think is another differentiator in what we do. But I also think to go back to the origin story and also you know, continued credit to the, to the DECA team and the DECA engineers, we started our effort really thinking from a blank slate saying, how would we build a single-use visualization device if we started from a simple concept as opposed to starting from the existing status quo, the existing you know rod lens platform. And we've seen other examples of that where folks have looked at opportunities to deliver single use, but have really started from, if you will, use the overused cliche inside the box. We started from outside the box and that engineering pathway parallels with some of the uh, business strategies as well, where I think we've thought perhaps a little more fresh as a result of it. So yeah, look, if you'd asked me 20 years ago whether I'd be running a medical device company, first of all, probably would have said, what's a medical device company and what (laughs) business do I have being in a leadership position uh, to be able to do that? 
20 years later, I'm, I'm enjoying it. I think that the opportunity for somebody to be a leader of people to deliver a product that we firmly believe people want and continue to tell us that they want, it's the ultimate team exercise. And so I get a lot of reward about thinking about how we bring high quality talent in, how we point them in the right direction. We use kind of a hybrid model. We've got about six or eight people in New Hampshire, but most of our team is spread throughout the country, if not uh, internationally as well. So there's a lot of uh, challenge that comes with that, but it's also really rewarding. And for a guy who is a liberal arts graduate, it's the closest thing that I can say that I come to, to be inventive, if you will, by inventing on the business side of things and adding some creativity to that. And then and being able to implement that right as a leader of the organization. So um, I'm digging it. I really enjoy this as life you know, opens doors that you may never expected. Um, I'm uh, really privileged uh, to be in the seat of Pristine Surgical today. That's interesting. I was going to ask if you're, you're being located in New Hampshire sort of added to that conspicuous or outsider perspective, but it sounds as if a bulkier team actually is, is well, a little bit of them ever, are almost everywhere, it seems. Yeah, look, we're in New Hampshire because that's where DECA is located. And yep. we located, you know, just up the Merrimack River, a couple of miles in some some space that uh, has suited us well. And that's the Chamber of Commerce story for, for why we're in New Hampshire. But of course, what most people forget from time to time about New England is that New England's really small. Yep. So we're an hour from <laughs> Logan Airport, right? I mean, even though we cross uh, state lines and, and we, we go uh, down into, into our big brother in, in Massachusetts, in some places, if you were in Texas or in California, we'd be but a county away, not a not a state away. So we're really part of the broader, greater Boston metro area in that regard. And as you know, that's uh, as you know well, uh, that's one of the great medical device clusters in the country. And so we think of ourselves really as part of that as well. No, oh, absolutely. And you're in full disclosure. You're probably about thirty minutes from me where I live, so uh, I know the space well. Uh, I just wanted to. Uh, I know you got to go. We were at J.B. Morgan, but uh, you mentioned the subscription model. What does that look like? How does that work? Yeah, so the, the easiest way to introduce the answer to the question is think about basically grocery shopping uh, versus HelloFresh if you <laughs> uh, you know subscribe to grocery services like that or meal preparation services like that. We've seen a proliferation in a variety of different uh, arenas, a variety of different markets around subscription. Of course, subscription, anything from Uber to Amazon Prime to, you know, you can now get a car, you know, by subscription, you go get out your, uh, you know, Audi, whatever it might be. And you, you, you basically pay for that on a monthly basis. And that's it. The only thing you put in is, is gasoline or plug it into the, uh, uh, to the EV outlet. So we've taken that emergence of the subscription business model and applied it to our medical device company. So the incumbent technology is a classic CapEx laden environment spend $100,000 to $120,000 to buy the system, spend about $6,000 or so to uh, monthly for the service plan that's associated with that, and then about $100 or so per procedure in order to sterilize the scopes. And so if you take that by contrast in a subscription offering, we simplify that dramatically. We move just like the other subscription models from a fixed cost with an amortization type of, of mode to one where you move to a variable cost model. And that's very attractive to our facilities, particularly, frankly, as an aside, when economic times are difficult and balance sheets are, are strained at, at, at our customers, if they can move to a variable cost model, that's attribute number one. And then we deliver that savings to our customers that I talked about as well on a per procedure basis. So when you look at those three buckets that I talked about on the existing purchasing paradigm, we only have two. So we do away with any upfront cost. We don't charge any CapEx in order to deploy our devices. We'll charge a monthly subscription fee, which is relatively low cost. And then we'll charge a per kit fee, as you would imagine, as you use those scopes and pull them off of inventory, you simply pay um, pay as you go. Okay. And so, uh, as I mentioned at the outset of the, answering the question, it really follows that subscription modality in a variety of different markets. We've gotten really great responses to that. That's a twist on the way that facilities are used to procuring equipment, and they get really a grin on their face when they go through and think about what the benefits are. And also comparing that to say, well, gee, if I do that at home, and I've gotten very comfortable with that, it makes right. perfect sense to do it also uh, in, in a commercial, and in this case, in a, in a medical environment. Do you typically require, or do they typically require more or less physical space at their plant? 
because they don't have to store their pieces of equipment anymore, but maybe they have to store boxes of your things or, or does it kind of even out? It's significantly less. So significantly less. 60% of ambulatory surgery centers in the U.S. are multidisciplinary surgery centers. So for those facilities in particular, they've got a lot of equipment that's sitting unused in some storeroom that has to be rotated out into the, the ORs when the particular procedure is, is being used. That's a challenge for surgery centers that typically don't have a lot of space to go around in the first time. Right. You got overuse of, uh, of their sterilization departments and, and capabilities. You see in ambulatory surgery centers, a wave of total joint procedures, which are now mo moving into the ASCs. So ASCs are tremendously space constrained. And so, yes, we help that. And thank you for, for, the, for the prompt. We help that tremendously as well. You simply have a store of boxes on the shelf that we know exactly where they are and we know exactly how many they are because we've digitized the entire supply chain and we watch that consumption go through. And when the customer sets a, a particular uh, order level, we'll simply refulfill and restock those shelves. So we can keep that footprint down small and really as small as the facility would like us to be able to be. And then we know exactly when we we uh, issue that reorder and we can fulfill and uh, restore the inventory on demand. Fantastic. All right. Well, like I said, I know you're at JP Morgan. You got places to be and people to see. So uh, I'll let you go. Thanks, uh, Brian, for taking the, the time today. And we look forward to following Christine's story and having you back on the podcast. Well, thanks, Tom. It's a big part of my day. So great to see you and uh, great to be with you. Thank you. All right, Chris Newmarker, great to have you back on the podcast in the new year. Uh, where can folks find you on social media? Oh, find me on LinkedIn, Chris Newmarker, just like a, a new marker. So always, always happy to chat. All right, same here. I am on LinkedIn, Tom, S-A-L-E-M-I. And uh, Chris, I, I threw this question at Sean last week. He, I can't tell if he really flubbed it or if he was just pretending to flub it. But uh, did, what do, what do we want? Sean did well, by the way. He's, you know, he's, he did really yeah, well. It's good. He, watch your back, Chris Newmarker. <laughs> Hooli's coming at you. No, he yeah. did really well. It was really great. And it's great to get other folks on the podcast. We'll definitely try yeah. to get Danielle Kirsch and Jim Hamran and Brian Bunce all back. We got the a podcast. good team here. Uh, it's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, certainly a lot more fun with a lot more people. But uh, what should folks out there in podcast land do? Oh, they need a like, follow, subscribe. That's right. Like, follow, and or subscribe. We want you to follow the Device Talks podcast network so you can get the Device Talks weekly podcast striker talks intuitive talks and other podcasts that are coming your way and also please uh, like follow and or subscribe to the medtronic talks channel as well so you don't miss any future episodes of medtronic talks and please do uh, share this podcast on the social media channels we've just been talking about so uh so other folks can can find them and uh, tag chris and myself when you do so we can be part of those conversations hey everybody have a happy new year